This is The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyado. Welcome to another edition of Curtain Up, our show all about Russian culture in the capital. The Nutcracker has recently opened at the Royal Opera House, following the English National Ballet, which launched its production in late November. Families from all over England are travelling down to London to see the ballet at Christmas. But the Nutcracker wasn't always so popular. In fact, when it first premiered in the late 19th century, it was a bit of a flop. To find out more, I invited Russian music expert Daniel Jaffe into the studio. I began the conversation by asking Daniel to tell me more about how the ballet was first received. Nutcracker was not a great success at its first performance. I think they were trying to do something entirely new. The man who was behind the Steeping Beauty was the director of the Mariinsky, or rather he was the director of the Imperial Theatres, Ivan Sevlovsky. He's an extraordinary man. He himself was a very talented designer, and he absolutely adored ballet and thought that ballet itself should be vastly improved from what it was. You had specialist ballet composers, you had choreographers, but they didn't actually work very closely together. The music was very generic. What's this extraordinary about the Nutcracker was from the very start, this has never been done before, certainly not in Russia, let's give major parts to child dancers. It was unheard of, pretty much unheard of um, in the 19th century. That, I think, was a revolutionary thing, and that's, I think, the fundamental reason why the Nutcracker didn't work. And is that because dancing was just seen as an adult profession? Or? Exactly, yes. It was seen very much as an adult profession for very good reason. I mean, it's not just a pretty art, it's a very taxing art. You need tremendous physical stamina and training and discipline and learning all, you know, the whole business of training up dancers. I think what was revolutionary, though, was um, Sevlovsky had great faith in what Petipa was doing. I mean, Petipa was really raising a game of ballet. And I think probably, this is speculation, because I don't think there's so uh, many hard evidence that's come up, except why on earth was he thinking of using child dancers? We know that child dancers, increasingly up to the age of 11, 12, can actually absorb a great deal of the, um, more than just the fundamentals of dancing. They can actually become very great dancers in their own right. And I think perhaps he was aware of some child dancers of that ilk who he was hoping would be showcased by this ballet. And also this ballet is about a child. Clara is a child mm. at the beginning, isn't yes. she? And she enters places like the magical kingdom of sweet. So it does seem appropriate that there should be children involved. And it is a ballet partly for children, though I, we can come back to that. Yes, I mean, well, I suppose it's a bit of a chicken and egg question. And um, obviously, Sevlovsky, who chose the story of the Nutcracker, chose it because he thought... This is featuring um, a child protagonist. Um, I think she's called Marie in the original Hoffman story. She's renamed Clara in the ballet. So it is about um, her, I suppose, reaching out into a, an other fantasy world, but um, she's exerting herself. She's, I mean, there's been all sorts of post-Freudian speculation of um, what it's about. Sometimes people have been nudging uh, Clara to become a more on the edge of puberty, whereas, um, in fact, in the original story, she's only seven years old. So there's um, this tremendous strain about what is it all about. And also there, there are adult aspects to this. This is possibly a tale about somebody coming of age, growing up, mm. finding out that the world isn't as simple as they thought. The mm. incredible Christmas tree at the Royal Opera House, a bit like Alice, you know, who yeah. becomes bigger, the girl or the tree. Yes, yeah, so that is an interesting point. The whole idea of, you know, size changing and everything become topsy-turvy and um, the small becomes significant. Just to carry on with the children a bit, because you've, I'm sure, seen plenty of productions, and I have too, where uh, children are used very effectively in the Nutcracker and their different kinds of creatures, their children, their mice. But when Nutcracker first was first staged, people said that the use of children was chaotic and messy and, mm. and didn't work at all. Maybe they used too many children, maybe the children weren't directed well enough. I think it was a question that they weren't directed well enough and also they didn't just use child dancers. Basically what happens, something went wrong early on because Petipa lost faith in what he was being asked to do. Having agreed that in the first act originally we were going to have a whole series of national dances, some of which almost certainly ended up in the last act. You know, the, the Spanish dance for chocolate and um, the Arabian dance for coffee and so on and so forth. But originally the children were going to dance this in the first act. And then suddenly Petipa said, I am not having this. Petipa being a Frenchman, I'm going to do a terrible French accent, probably. <laughs> anyway, he, he was very unhappy with the idea of using child actors. And he started insisting he used adult um, dancers. 
Sevilovsky, I think, rode roughshod over saying, this is not what we agreed to do. And so Pesipa auditioned and cast the roles of her Clara and the Nutcracker and her brother Franz. And then he promptly fell ill just as the thing was going into rehearsal. So in fact, the rehearsals were overseen by his uh, second in command, um, Lev Ivanov, who proved himself eventually as a very fine choreographer of uh, corps de ballet. I mean, he did a wonderful production of the second act of Swan Lake. And Swan Lake had previously only been done in Moscow, not very well. But then, really, um, first of all, Lev Ivanov started showing what a quality ballet Swan Lake was. But um, he was suddenly landed with doing this extraordinary concept of a ballet with mainly child dancers, and he just didn't know what to do with them, or didn't care to do much with them. He was very good at the corps de ballet um, sequences, but he tends to say, yes, yes, quite, when the uh, leading dancers have said, I don't like my steps, could I please do this or that to it? And he said, yes, of course. And, you He'd know, just let them... He, he, he was very laid back. He was more interested in having an easy time. He enjoyed doing the corps de ballet, but anything that didn't really interest him, he was going to be diverse by talking about card games in the middle rehearsals, and he just was absolutely... It was a disaster for ballet, in short. And then somebody had the great idea of, of a battle scene between the toy soldiers and the mice of recruiting cadets from a local military school. And I don't know how much preparation they were given, but it seems it was very much a freefall. They were armed with these toy rifles, and there was these mice played by children, and uh, they got a bit carried away. You can imagine how children, you know, when it gets excited. A bit overexcited, a bit dangerous on stage. Well, appalling. Nobody mentions anyone getting injured, but um, it was absolutely chaotic. Alexander Benoit, he was the godfather of uh, Ballet Russe. He was a great fan of Sevolozhsky um, as well. He was the one who said to Diaghilev, look, what Sevolozhsky has done, let's do something similar. They created a Ballet Russe. But he witnessed this first production. He said, this is absolutely amateurish and hopeless, chaotic. And since then, it's become one of our favourites. Though, do you think sometimes the music of the Nutcracker is not so much appreciated here as in Russia, just because of slightly different taste? I mean, is there such a thing? I think it's been a degree of snobbery. One of my former professor, David Brown, was particularly damning about the Nutcracker. He said it was a stupid, trite plot. Clara goes to sweet heaven just because she throws a shoe at the mouse. What a silly story, basically. It hasn't got this of trappings of Sleeping Beauty, which is all about regeneration, the idea of spring breaking forth after a winter of somebody being asleep. The depth of Tchaikovsky's music has been talked about, hasn't it, by other critics, maybe not critics like your professor, but the musicologist Boris Asafiev talked about Nutcracker representing the ripening soul of a little girl. What do you think of that? Some people have criticised that as implying that she's far more pubescent than she is actually meant to be. I think the point that um, you know, she's moving from what seems the trivial world to just playing with dolls and actually sort of investing emotionally in things, that is a stage of growing up which happens before pubescence. So in that sense, he's not wrong at all. And he was also very important because those who half like the ballet tend to go for the second act, which is all pure adult dancing. Whereas he actually took the first act very, very seriously and said as a narrative, I mean, of course, that was the flavour of the time in the Soviet Union. He wrote this in the decade when Prokofiev wrote Romeo and Juliet, which was one of the great narrative ballets, which are definitely telling a story. So I think in that sense, he was in tune with the times and he said about the first act being about something, about a girl sort of growing up. I think the thing is that um, Tchaikovsky did take the ballet very seriously and um, there's a lot of psychology implicit in his music. One of the reasons that some people don't like the Nutcracker is that it sometimes gets watered down and made into a ballet that's purely for children mm. and all its dark sides, all its mystery, it's sort of wiped out. Well, I think people sort of try to make it a family-friendly... I mean, it happens to so many things. It also happens to A Christmas Carol, for example, by Dickens. I mean, again, you have the dark elements watered down and taken out it's made to, to a cosy family entertainment. And sometimes a bit gooey as well. Uh, yes, sometimes a bit gooey. Possibly that may be more the amateur end of productions rather than professional productions. I suppose Absolutely. the danger of professional productions going the other direction is it's a bit removed, it's a bit aloof, a bit too specialist. Now, one of the things I also wanted to ask you about was the unusual orchestration of the Nutcracker, mm. introducing some colours that hadn't been seen or heard before. I don't know if you hear or see a colour, but... 
<laughs> oh, well, yeah, no, you certainly hear colours. I mean, well, orchestral colours. We're so used to talking about it. It's, it's funny terminology, but absolutely, yes. You, you can hear the different timbres and different sort of sounds, colours of um, the instruments. And most famously, Tchaikovsky introduced the Celesta, which is basically a keyboard instrument which plays a metal plates like a glockenspiel. The great advantage, of course, having a keyboard is that you can play very rapid arpeggios or rapid passage work, which is perfect for his purposes. Basically, Pesipo, when he was drafting this scenario, wanted to be, there wanted to be there some kind of a magical fountain when the sugar plum fairy appears. Hence, you have all this wonderful, glistening, glistering music when she appears, which is played by Celesto. Tchaikovsky discovered this, actually, when he was composing a ballet when he was just about to set off for a tour in America. And, of course, he went, this was before people could fly, he went over to France, first of all, to take a ship from there. And he stopped by in Paris, and he went to the Mustel, which was an organ workshop. But uh, Mustel, as well as making organs, also had invented this instrument, which has just been shown at the Paris exhibition, the great uh, Universal Exhibition, in 1890. And um, in Mustel's um, workshop, he saw this extraordinary instrument. He instantly saw the implications. And he wrote this letter to his publisher, begging him to buy this instrument, saying, please buy this, because I'm definitely going to be making use of this. I'm going to be using it for my new ten poet poem, The Voyevodre, and I will also be using it in my new ballet for Nutcracker. Don't let Rimsky, Korsakoff and Glasnov know about this. I'm terrified again to sort of use a special instrument before I do. You know, I want to make it a great surprise, a coup de theatre. Well, it does have an awfully pretty sound as well, mm. doesn't it? Very appropriate for Christmas and for children. Well, yes, and it's also very appropriate for Drosselmeyer's world. Drosselmeyer is the man who gives the nutcracker to Clara in the ballet, and he's a great clockmaker and, you know, makes automaton and all that sort of stuff. And, of course, the idea of clockwork goes very well with musical boxes. So this wonderful tinkling sound, which is very... It's, it's absolutely ideal for, for the Nutcracker in that respect, I think. And the other orchestral colour that's interesting in Nutcracker is how the, the flutes are used. Yes, the flutter of flutes, exactly. But I think this is... Obviously, it wasn't an absolutely brand-new technique. This was demonstrated to Tchaikovsky by one of his former pupils, one of his former harmony pupils, who'd become a professional flautist. Basically, um, you <laughs> blow down the flute and rolling your tongue at the same time, and it produces this wonderful purring sound. It's been used a lot in, in 20th century scores, but I think it still has an extraordinary... Tchaikovsky has such a good ear. He didn't just produce wonderful new sounds, but he used them in a very apt way. That was Daniel Jaffe talking to me, Alice Laniado, about the Nutcracker. This is The Voice of Russia in London. Stay tuned. <laughs>